Greetings Internet and welcome to Aaron Plays and I hope you're doing fantastically well. This is going to be the first and maybe the second, depends how long it takes, turns of Tarawa. I wanted to shoot this a couple of days ago but due to both work and not feeling too well it's been delayed. So this has been shot on the 22nd of November so two days after the invasion occurred 80 years ago. Not ideal because I did, say, did want to record this on the 20th. But okay. Anyway. So this will be the initial, at least the initial first turn in completion. And depending on how long the video runs, I might do the second turn as well. So let's get down to the map. And remember... The likes, subscribes, and the comments, and the dingling, all appreciated. Let's go down. Okay, so I've set up the American units, ready to bring them in. So we have Red Beach 1, Red Beach 2, and Red Beach 3. I've not done any of the sequence of play stuff as yet, so that's just the Americans ready to land. Um, effectively, we've got a Marine Infantry unit. Um, let's zoom in a little bit on what these actually look like. So on the actual counter itself, Each one of these is a company. We have how many steps are in that company, so it's a four step unit. It's telling me the fire strength and the range. Designation here is what turn it comes in. So turn one on Red Beach two. And this here is the company, so this is easy company. Okay. When it takes a step loss, it will be flipped to as such. Three steps, no longer no longer within range, and this is the equipment that it carries. When it's at this strength, it carries its full allotment, which is on the actual chart. The symbol here on it is used for when taking or determining casualties. Each of the cards, if we show you one of the cards, the, the one card that we've drawn so far in the game, which was used to determine the Japanese armour, this is using a circle. So if these cars was firing at units, it would hit units with the circle on it. There are three symbols, diamond, circle, and triangle. So on each beach, there are two infantry companies coming in. Let's just zoom, out, zoom in, let's zoom out a little bit. And two engineers coming in at each beach. What we'll do now is start going through the sequence of play. And the first step up is the US amphibious operations phase. And the first step of that is assign available LVT markers to units in beach approach hexes. These are called a breach, a breach, a beach approach hex. These are the LVTs and each one of those gets assigned there are a total of nine and they are assigned one to each unit or one to each stack these LVTs have also got two steps two and one a two-step unit can carry up to four steps of units that's not exactly correct. Each two-step unit can carry one or two units, totaling four steps. And a one-step LVT can only carry a one, one unit of up to two steps. So there's enough LVTs to get all the initial invasion mounted up and ready to go. It all depends on how many actually survive that journey 
Quite a distance, doesn't it look like in hexes? Especially if you're gonna to have to walk it later on. Okay. So that's the first step. So I've assigned LVTs. The next step, and this is a very procedural step again, conduct a landing check for each LV2, LVT unit. Now, I've got a deck of cards which should be kept right over there, that box there. But my little lens can't reach. Not where I'm trying to keep the camera in. So I have the deck of cards in the end. And what I'll do, they're, they're sitting quite comfortably there. Okay. And I draw two cards for each of these runs. The first card will denote, if I show you on a card that's already been drawn in this game, we're just looking at the top row, LVT no drift, or it'll be drift to the right or left. The second card will actually look for the losses. So this tells me with a U is for the unit. That tells me that three steps arrive. And that tells me one step of LVTs arrives. So the four, if it was a four step unit, it would lose one step and the LVT would lose a step. And it tells me it lands on the beach. And I will be doing that for each of these hexes. There's nine hexes, so there's gonna be a total of 18 cards drawn. So, and I start from my right, so this will be the first one done. Okay, so this is for the drift. And it tells me it drifts one to the right, so it drifts over to here. You can see. It then will follow the path in. But first of all, we have to see if it actually gets there. So it's going to be following this path. The next step, it tells me all four steps land. And so there's no losses on this. So it goes one, two, it follows. There, 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 as it says beat the word beach, it lands on the beach there. There are different. That LVT is then returned to the LVT available box. That's a good start. Next hex. So let's bring it back down. This one. And it tells me. LV Drift PR. Okay. The PR only applies for Red Beach 2. So we're okay on that. So there's, that means no drift. And then the losses. That's another one. Four and two. So that gets through as well. So again, following the... In it goes... And it was also landing on the beach. So that's where it gets to. And they land. And that's the two lots of engineers landing on the beach. So far, so good. This unit now. Okay, is drift. It tells me it drifts one to the left. So it's that way. And then it tells me all four get in, no loss to, to the LVTs, but it goes inland one hex. Should leave that the way for the moment. Okay, so again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I don't need to count really. Eight to there. So 
lands there and then goes inland. Now, following that path, it was there, 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 there. Got to make sure I go the same route there. They go to there. If there had been a Japanese unit there, there'd have been an instant post combat. And yes, notice there is a leader with them. That is Mr. I think his name's Ryan. And Colonel, Ryan, uh, Colonel Ryan, I believe his name was. He's got the word Ryan on him, so, but I think he was a colonel. He is a hero that I actually start with in the game. Okay. We now move over to beach two, starting with this hex. So the drift, this is no drift, sorry. No drift, but I'm glad I didn't draw this for the landing. It would have been a complete wipeout. Okay, next card, what happens to it? All right, so we have our first losses. So of these guys, and now notice the arrow is pointing this way. If that PR card that came out earlier, then they would have actually landed that way. I presume it must be something to do with the tidals and the waters and such forth. But they're coming in this way and the card tells me they're landing on the beach. So in we go. We carry on in. And they get to there, which is the beach. And that's where they come in. And I'll just take the LBT away. Right, so that's the pile of cards we've got at the present moment. Let's get them all together. Right, next in. Two engineers. And it does say drift PR, which means they go that way. And next up, it tells me, oh, did I? Should have removed one step off that previous unit. I remember it was saying three steps, so I'll take, flip that over to its one step loss. These have got three steps, get through, one LVT shot down, and it stops in the water. Now, following this hex row along, there is a water there where you see these little squares. That's where, if it comes up with the word water, that's where they stop. So effectively, I've lost a step of engineers. So I'll flip him over. And the LBT. And then I move it along that spine. And they stop there in the water. And then we'll have to wade the rest of shore, which isn't too bad. But I've lost one step of LBTs. Move into the next unit. The drift. No drift. Next card. Okay. Three steps of units gets through, so this will take a step loss. The on track is completely lost, hence the LX, and it stops in the water. So following that along route it stops there the Amtrak is lost and there in the water that not nice hmm okay moving over to third beach starting with this unit the drift is no drift and all four steps get ashore. So do the two Amtraks, but it comes into inland one. So following that row in, that's the beach. Inland one gets them to there. Not too bad. 
next this one here the card drawn is drift one to the left and the actual all four steps land one lbt is lost and it's on the beach so going in the two engineers land there we've lost an lbt and then the last but not least no drift oh but a disaster only one step of units gets through the lbt is completely lost and lands on the beach so now i need to find the breakdown for that unit so each of these units has a breakdown counter when he takes so first step loss flips over second step loss this unit is removed and replaced with one of these but only one step was getting through so it takes an it's it takes another step loss it's eliminated and it lands on the beach uh, not good this counter whoops that's the camera gone this is why it's trying to squeeze it all on and try not to sorry that okay ends up in the u.s infantry division marine losses over there and that is that phase completed okay so now i can move the board a little bit so i've got a bit of space I will now, though all the cards that I've drawn so far will be now placed in there. It's still a right stretch to get up to the deck, so I'm going to keep it close to me. We have now finished the US amphibious operations phase. We now go into the event phase. Now, there is no card drawn for this event phase. The event is predetermined. It tells me in the rule book, do not draw a event card on the first turn. The event is just add depth to two Japanese units. That means two Japanese units on the board will get some, yeah, I'm moving the board a little bit, depth counters. What is a depth counter, I hear you ask? Okay, each of these Japanese units on the map, is their initial strength and they can receive reinforcements by these two piles here inland depth and coastal depth so if it tells me to place and once they get a depth marker placed on them those two counters then become inseparable so it shows the japanese at full strength so if i attack this japanese unit here with this unit say and it tells me to reveal a depth marker. I would draw one of those and it will be added to there and add, added to its strength. Okay, so it's telling me that the event is add depth to two Japanese units. And there's a particular procedure when I do this. As I said, it's very procedural. Try and find a little too many charts. Hold on there. Okay, so there's a Japanese depth marker placement priority. So it says place beneath a non-tank unit with no depth marker in communication. We'll come to communication later. So I'm going to place depth into, first of all, closest to a US unit. Now at present, and I'm going to mark these little green tokens to show what's going on. That is adjacent or clo closest to a US unit. So is that, so is that, and that one, and over, over here, there, and there. So that's one, two, three, four, there's six cubes I've placed out there, but only two of them will receive the depth marker. So next up, so that's those ones are the closest 
So it definitely won't be going like on a, a unit that's further on those because those are the closest to a US unit. Then it says if equidistant, a coastal position. All of these are coastal positions because they're right next to the coast. And that's denoted by letter C in the hex. If I need to zoom in on that a little bit. And a bit more. There you go. So the, the letter C in there denotes that it is a coastal unit. And uh, all of these units, if they're right adjacent to the beach, they are coastal units. Okay. And then if any of them would have been inland positions, the coastal takes precedence. Then it says within a position type, which is all of those, it says the lowest ID number, then a lowest letter. So I'm looking for the lowest ID number. And if we look on here, again, let me zoom in. You see he's marked E1. So he's, he's position one so we're looking so he's likely this guy here is a position oh, bloody fingers this one here is position three moving along to these two this one here is a position five this one here is a six and going to these two over here This one is a position that looks like a one as well and a three. So we've got two ones, which will get the reinforcements. Sorry, the depth markers might be the best way to say it. Yeah, the depth markers. If there'd been three ones, we would have gone in the lowest letters. So the closest to A. But there isn't. So we've got an F1. He will get a depth marker and a coastal. So I take it from these here. These have all been shuffled. I just put them in nice, sweet, neat rows because it does my head in if they're all higgledy piggledy. But they have all been shuffled. So this one here gets one. I have no idea what that strength is in that counter now. And it was this one here, wasn't it? Yeah. This one here. Yeah, it was one here. He gets a depth, coastal depth. There we go. And then I'll remove all those cubes. So that was the options. I won't go into this kind of detail for all of them in the future. I'm just showing you how it works. Where it tells me to add depth. That's what happens. And that's the event phase. Completed. The next up is the, oh, I move the phase marker. Notice there's no event card on there. So the next one up with the Japanese fire phase. Now I draw a card from the deck, and I've got the deck next to me, which will then determine the enemy fire. So here's the card. So it's telling me positions red, purple, and brown, potentially, keyword is potentially, activate. So I'm gonna keep that beside me. I'm gonna zoom right out there, or not right out. We can ignore the letters on here for the time being because none of these letters have become activated yet. Those letters are under these counters here and the first one will activate on turn three. So we don't have to worry about the letters. So it's telling me the red fire groups will fire. The purple, if they have got either a depth or two units, because there's two symbols there, will fire and the brown will fire and they're targeting particularly triangles. There's also some artillery. We'll come through the artillery fire after we resolve this. So what we're going to do, we, I do this one at a time. We'll look at all the red positions, then all the purple, then all the brown. And 
I'm going to start from the western edge of the map. Okay, so we're looking for red. So blue's fine, they don't fire. We have a brown unit here, so it's a potential fire. Blue, red. Well, this red, there's nothing to fire over here. This brown unit, we look at all its fire zones. Am I in? No, I'm only in yellow here and blue here. So there's no risk there. And this unit here, poses a different way of doing it. It's only under threat of green. So really, I'm actually looking at threats. My guys in the water could be potentially hit by purple. Is there anyone in purple though? Purple, there's a purple. Moving along. There is a purple here. Okay, and his fire zone extends out into the water. If you can see this purple line running across the map. This guy's in the purple. And the purple though requires, looking at the card, two units in that fire group to active. There's only one unit. Either two units or a unit and its depth marker. So that purple, which is extending fire into here, if that had been a single, my unit here, because it's a triangle, would have taken a loss. But as there's only one unit there, and it's a double there, I'm okay. Right, so continuing down the front, so I'm looking where my units are at the moment. When I've got more units on it, it's easier to do it the other way. So this guy is under threat from blue and red. Okay. Now notice the symbol in this hex. Let me just zoom a little bit in there. Okay. So you can see it's got a circle with which is not f filled in. That denotes steady fire. Steady fire must definitely match the symbol on the card. So even though he's in the red, which, looking at the card, again, only requires one unit, because he hasn't got the symbol, it's a triangle, he doesn't take a loss. If that had been a triangle, he would have taken a step loss. Okay, carrying on. This unit here, is in the water from the blue. We have been blue just outside the red fire zone, so he's okay. Moving along. This unit here is in an intensive purple. But again, the purple unit has just the one guy in it. If there being again another a depth marker there or another unit in in there then my guy would have taken a loss but because there's only one and that purple required two again looking at the card there he's okay keep moving along these guys blue and brown there is a brown steady fire there which is coming from by the looks of it over here yeah there's a brown there there's a brown steady and I have got a unit with a triangle in it. I can't see any reason why he wouldn't take a step loss. Unfortunately. And then this unit. That's a brown intensive. Now when it's intensive, I, don't, I think it ignores the symbol. Let me just double check that. Yep, that's right. If you're in an intensive fire zone, your units of every type and target symbol lose one step. Now, as there's two units in this fire position, they can cause two hits. So if I had all of these sitting in the intensive fire area, I still only take two hits. I have taken two hits and this unlucky company has been completely wiped out. I had a struggle to get through 
and hits an intensive fire zone and it's taken out completely. That looked nice. Oh, just as an aside, I should have in the amphibious assault phase placed new units that are arriving on turn two on those beach hexes. Assault beach hexes, whatever they're called. So, oh, right terminology. Arrival box. But that would have been not flying by the camera. So I've I'm left them left them off for the time being. I should actually get putting them on, I could take a note of what hexes that they're they're coming in on. Um, because I can't shift them once I place them on there. But uh, I did try it a little bit with the camera and yeah, they're just getting not, not flying because they're right on the edge there. I'll tell you what, what I've just placed them. There they are. I'm trying not to knock them. But I can always refer back to this video, can't I? So those are ready. That, that was done as the last step of the amphibious invasion step is you place any new arrivals so that's my turn two reinforcements and here we go so we've just done and completed the japanese fire phase i'm going to place the card up the top there now the next box is another event phase box, but that doesn't come into until after turn 10. Here we have US Engineers and HQ phase. Again, it doesn't really come into effect until after turn. Skip on turns one to 10, it says. So these two steps are skipped. And you know what I might actually do is put a marker on there remind me that those two steps are skipped and then the next step is I can actually do something US action phase now in the US action phase I've got three of these counters that I can activate either a stack or a single unit if I activate a stack they all must do the same thing either fire at the same target move into the same hexes if I want them to do separate things then I've got to spend two of these action tokens so for all my units on the board I have two action uh, three actions that doesn't seem fair does it well yeah I do get some free actions as well Units that get free actions are units stacked with a hero, so they will get a free action. I'm pointing and you can't, I'm off camera. So they will get a free action, and I'm going to denote that as such. Later in the game, as I get HQs, any unit adjacent to a HQ gets a free action. These actions cannot be used for units out in the water they will move in the next amphibious phase they'll wade ashore so i've got three actions and one free action don't think i've got any others darn it let's rewind a little bit Ooh, forgot about the uh, japanese artillery and that's why it's useful that the cards stay here Right, Japanese artillery. Okay. Now, if you can see here, I put some cubes out. The yellow cubes are the light, the or orange cubes are the medium, and the red are the heavy artillery that the units have got, enemy have got. Um, as they will lose some of these batteries, hopefully, I will remove these it just makes it easier to count because when I look at this fire card at the bottom, it says there's got to be one heavy at plus six any to be able to do an artillery attack. If they had lost both of their heavies, they wouldn't have been able to do this card. So they can. 
So we've got to do an artillery strike. And that hits mainly the guys. Well, it could any, hit any guys. So let's go through the artillery strike procedure. Right. So it still looks at that symbol, that triangle. And it says, choose a non-HQ unit with a target symbol shown on the card to lose a step in the following priority. In a beach approach hex. Now, if you remember, I, that's why I've placed those units out in the beach approach hexes. After all. So it's looking... It's not an easy amount because it's... Okay, so these are the beach approach hexes and one of those will take a hit priority so they're shooting my guys as they're coming in if i hadn't had any units in there then they would have been targeting anything in the water then anything in the beach hex well there is one two three units marked with triangles so again moving this out so either this unit, this unit, or this unit will take the step loss. And I can choose. Great. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm going to take it on the heavy weapons team here because that is the most successful area I've landed in, whereas everywhere else needs a little bit of help. So, one artillery, thank you very much, and back. So yeah, I did that slightly out of order, but nothing had progressed beyond that because it was the next step was my US units. Here's my three counters. And now this is the actual thinking part for me. What am I going to do? What do I want to do? What do I want to achieve? Only my units that are on land can do anything, as I said earlier. Uh, if I decide to move them, which they're allowed to do, uh, they can move up to two hexes. But if I move from a Japanese, adjacent to a Japanese unit, adjacent to another hex adjacent to the, the same Japanese unit, that's infiltration, and I take a risk of being shot at. We could also do some attacks. And other options will be actually go in to close combat. Do I fire or do I go in? That. So I'm looking at this unit here. He's adjacent to the... I have no idea what that strength of that unit is. It could be risky. Do I fire or do I go in? I can move into its X and then that will initiate close combat. All firing is resolved before clo close combat is resolved. Do I go in or not? I think we're going to fire rather than go into close combat. So that's going to be my first action. Now, do I have to premeditate these? No, I don't need to premeditate. I mark them as action taken. I suppose it's written on the actual counter. As I activate them, I place the marker. So I'm going to fire this guy into this hex here. So we're then going to resolve, or how is fire resolved? So I've got a attack strength of seven. And I've got this little chart now again it's not easy to see i'm sorry quite a lot of information on here but what i've got to do is u.s attack results chart u.s attackers possess required weapons now this is a full company and it tells me on the u.s weapons chart what they are armed with so an infantry with four steps on a heavy weapon infantry with three or four steps, 
Attacking from adjacent hex has all that equipment there. So they've got bazooka, machine guns, browning automatic rifle, mortar, radio, demolitions, and flamethrower, but only the heavy infantry have flamethrower. The importance of that is when I flip that Japanese unit, it will tell me what its requirements are to be able to take it out. Let's zoom a little bit there. So I now can flip that unit because I've declared an attack. Well, that's fortuitous because it's got a combat strength of zero and the word FT is flamethrower, which I don't have, but it's got a combat zero strength of zero. If I had gone into, had gone into close combat, I'd have probably eliminated that straight away. But now we've got to go through the fire process. Okay, I've just checked the rules. Reveal the Japanese unit. If not revealed, so I just thought it wasn't revealed, I've now revealed it. The hex has an unrevealed depth marker. Do not reveal it yet. So if there had been a depth, mark, depth marker in there, I wouldn't have revealed it at this point. If the hex does not have a depth marker and the Japanese unit strength is zero, the unit is defeated. So it's defeated straight away. I don't have to worry about that FT. If there had been a depth marker under there, then the combat would have gone further. But because he got, if he had a one on him, combat strength or more, then I would have to have carried on the combat. But because he got bang on a zero, the combat ends at that point. That Japanese unit is eliminated. Also notice that it's got a white background. Some of these Japanese units have a red background. That would make them an elite unit. A non-elite unit that's eliminated is removed to the goes to the Japanese eliminated units box. So that Japanese unit is placed in the Japanese eliminated units box, which is right up there, just here. I'll turn it back upside down. During one turns one to fifteen, after turns sixteen, it'll be permanently removed from the game. I think they, from memory, when I played this game before, I believe some of them actually can return, ready to do the night attack or something that rings a bell. But we've got to get there first. So, okay, there is no advance after combat. So though I've taken out that position, I cannot advance. However, the key here is that L. That L gun can only fire if there is a Japanese unit in there. There is no Japanese unit. So I can remove, temporarily at least, one of these markers. So I'm going to sit that on the side of the board. Once I do enter that hex, I can place an artillery destroyed on there. It does give the time for the Japanese to actually re-enter that hex at the present moment because I can't advance after combat. So I've just placed the US action taken on top of that hex there. So I can't enter that hex. That L on there just tells me so I have now removed one of the light artillery pieces. I've got to enter that hex, as I said, to, to remove it. I'm repeating myself because I had the camera up here rather on here. First action taken. Okay, so there were two more. Do I want, see this has got a depth marker, I, I'm not at full strength here, so I, I'm not gonna declare an attack on that hex. I'm gonna hide behind the seawall, which is there. Moving along, we have my free action with Ryan. Now, he could fire with a range of two, on that unit there. But I believe to fire at range, there must also be a unit adjacent. Let me just double check. All right, my camera work, I must apologize, is not great. This map is difficult to, it's probably the hardest map I've had to cameraize on. It's because it's bits everywhere. So and I'm, I'm jabbering on, pointing at things and the camera's not even looking at them. We will get it right. Okay, so I'm wondering if I can fire from here onto this unit. 
he has got a range of two but can does it, a unit have to be adjacent as well from memory yes I even highlighted this piece so that's what happens when you read rules a Japanese occupied attack of Japanese occupied hex is one of my combat actions an attack must include at least one infantry or engineer unit adjacent to the Japanese occupied hex so in that case there isn't also to be able to close assault to go in with fisticuffs I must start adjacent as well so there's nothing Ryan can attack but that doesn't stop him moving and I want to get these guys back together so I'm going to move them into there and remember that is a free action so I'm going to put that on there to denote that I've actually done his free action. Second action, I think we want to try. There's two engineers here. I'm gonna get try and get these two guys to attack this unit here. So I'm gonna bring my action token over. Okay. And that's got the sea wall on it. Units strength doubled, depth is not. So whatever this unit strength is, it will be doubled. I'm attacking with four. Doesn't sound a lot, does it? Okay, so I will now reveal another zero. Okay. Good. That is eliminated as we've just found out in the previous one. But again, I can't advance. That's my second action. The third one is probably going to be the most risky. And that's here. Now, I'll, this has got a depth unit. So we reveal the top part and don't reveal the depth. Okay, so he's got a defense of two. I'm coming across that seawall. So that takes his defense to four. So the seawall doubles. Yeah, so his strength is four, mine is only seven. It's also telling me on there that I need FL, which is flanking, and bazooka. I don't have flanking. Flanking would be another unit attacking this from either here or here, with, not adjacent to this unit. So they could be attacking from here or here to get the flanking bonus. I don't have that. The other way to get some of these bonuses with a hero, I don't have a hero and such forth. So I haven't met both those required. The bazooka, yes, it's got bazookas, but I haven't met the other one. Notice this red background on here, rather than the white on the previous one that was in there. This is an elite unit. So this is where I, let me just zoom out a little bit, bring my chart up again on here so u.s attackers possess required weapons the answer is no because i haven't got that flanking u.s attack strength compared to japanese defense strength. A tank strength less or equal no tank strength greater but not double yes i'm seven to four so i'm on that column with there it says japanese unit alone no japanese unit an unrevealed depth marker u.s attackers disrupted that's what happens there Okay, so my guy becomes disrupted. All right. At least no losses. And place as such. And that will be, that's my three actions. So I place my, unit, my, my action markers down 
I will then remove said action markers because that's the end of the action phase. So those three have gone. And moving this along here, back up here, so you can see the phase marker. No additional cards were drawn. End of turn. So I take the last thing it says there is discard drawn cards. So I'll go back to all these here. So this is all the cards. And I'll place them next to the other cards, the undrawn ones, which is difficult again. And it says compare the two piles. And if this pile is bigger than this pile, noticeably, then I play carry on drawing from here. If this, the discard pile, was noticeably bigger than this pile, I would then shuffle. I don't count the cards. It, says, it uses, I think it uses the word noticeably. So these now go into my discard pile, which is right next to the board. And my draw pile, well, I'm going to leave it next to me. I know it should be right at the top there, but it's a long stretch for me. And that completes the first turn. So I move the turn marker on to turn two. The phase marker goes all the way back to the amphibious phase. And that's where I'm going to end it because this video has gone longer than I thought. That's with me explaining, I suppose, will take a bit longer by the time we get to about turn six or seven or eight, nine, ten, or wherever, how far we actually get. The turn should be quicker. I could probably then do turn, two turns per video. But I'm going to bring this back up and have a, a little bit of a chin chin wag. As I said earlier, the, the game is very procedural. You follow that step by step. <laughs> I, I miss the artillery. Got so carried away. I'm going to get to do something. Um, try and remember, compared to my previous game, I think it's about the same. Um, losing a complete unit of uh, Red 3, that was a bit nasty. So Red 3 is a little bit weakened. But We've made two successful attacks. Two units of zero did help. And all right, we got one disrupted, but at least we revealed the Japanese unit there. A revealed Japanese. That is a good point. If an attack is coming from an unrevealed position, they become disrupted. Forgot that one. But I don't think. No, I don't think anyone got attacked from an well all, all of them were unrevealed the one that did get attacked got eliminated so i think we're okay on that one lot to keep in the mind as well this is a it is more complex than omaha so if you played omaha this is a little bit more to it or it feels like it from from, from my perspective because i have played both i haven't played the other three as yet and i want to do these in Chronological order, so there's be this, and I think the next one would be Omaha. It's remembering, there's a lot of rules to remember, such as I've just said, their disruption. If you, if a Japanese unit fires on you and it's in an unrevealed state, it will disrupt an American unit, and a disrupted American unit therefore got an attack. I think that's it. I do apologise again for this being a couple of days late. I really, really wanted to get this down on the 20th to be the, the, the 80th anniversary. They were still fighting two days later. I mean, mopping up might be the more organised resistance had ceased, but they were still mopping up. So I'm still within the time frame, but it's not quite what I wanted. I hope you enjoyed it. So the next video will be obviously turn two and so on and then hopefully by the time we get into a, or i get back into the rhythm get back into all of the rules again um i'll be able to crack out two turns per episode but at the present moment one turn seems about right until next time enjoy what you're playing if you haven't got this i i thoroughly enjoy it as a solo game 
I enjoy it because of the experience. Um, it's a John Butterfield game. He, his solo designs are excellent. Um, yeah, I can't fault it enough because you've got decisions to make. Yes, the, the Japanese firing, um, the Amtraks and what actually lands and such forth is a little bit random, it's out of your control. But the, when you actually come to those actions and your decisions on there, they're paramount. Maybe not as much with decision making as maybe Ambush, which is another video I'm still going through. But there are there is depth to the to the, the opposition on this. Whereas in Ambush, it's obviously pre paragraph and pre program. Here, the Japanese will counterattack. The Japanese will react to what I'm doing, and they are very aggressive. Plays beautifully, and, and this is where it, I think it's harder than D-Day at Omaha. The Germans are fairly static in that one. Yeah, they can do a bit later to get their armor and such forth. But in this, yeah, the, the Japanese will come at you, and you will see that as as we play through. So again, yeah, if you enjoyed what I'm doing, hit the like. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already. It'd be much appreciated. All comments will be answered because um, I love the comments and remember the little dingling. But until next time, play games, have fun, bye internet.